I've been a software engineer for almost three years now, and I interviewed dozens of times at many different companies. And in this video, I'm going to share with you how I would structure my preparation if I had to start over and learn lead code again with a 12 week preparation plan with about 90 minutes for each day. This gives us 108 hours in total, assuming that you practice six days a week and take one day to rest. First, I will share with you the data structures and patterns I would learn and give you a little refresher for how they work. And then we're going to dive into the core questions of each topic with different difficulties. When starting out, and even if you've already studied lead code for a while, being good in the core topics is the most important part because they are in the most common questions asked and knowing them well means increasing your probability to pass interviews in the most efficient way. These data structures are arrays, trees, and graphs, and this is what you want to really focus on. Arrays, trees, and graphs are like the squat, bench press, and deadlift of lead code. In the 12 weeks, we're going to dedicate six weeks for patterns in arrays, then four weeks for patterns in trees, and then two weeks for patterns in graphs. Each pattern will have two sets of questions, one that you're going to start with studying the solutions to first learn the pattern, and then the other set that you're going to use to practice solving and applying the pattern that you learn. We're completely neglecting things like dynamic programming and all of its patterns, bitwise operations, linked lists, and many more. About 80 to 90% of the questions you will be asked will not be about those topics. This is based on what I have seen in my interviews and others, and really the easiest way for landing multiple offers is just being solid in the core topics. Once you're there, only then invest time into anything else, but don't do it randomly. For those, actually do it based on the specific company you're trying to get into. See what are the most asked topics in that company that are generally less common and practice based on that. So for example, if you want to get into Google after these 12 weeks, you will start working on dynamic programming as well. Now back to the preparation plan. In the first six weeks, we're doing arrays and we're starting with sliding window. In this pattern, we are given an array and we need to find the range in the array that satisfies a condition. The window is the subarray between two pointers and there are always three steps that we need to take. We expand the window, we meet the condition, and then we contract the window and we iterate on these steps until we've gone through the array. So for example, if we want to know what's the highest amount of consecutive ones, we will expand the window until we find a zero, then we will contract it and start expanding it again while we save the size of the largest window we have found so far. These are the questions I would work on during that first week so I could start identifying the pattern and solve questions. Now, I will have all of the questions for each week linked in a Notion template in the comment below, so don't worry about searching for these yourself. There are two important things when you study a solution to learn the pattern. First, studying the solution doesn't mean memorizing it. It means that you read the code and identify the high-level algorithm and how it's implemented. The best way I found to actually do this is with dry runs. So use a paper and a pen to write down the data structures and parameters that are used in the solution and work through an example. You do this to identify how the pattern works and handles what's being asked in the question. And you want to make sure that you really study the solution well and understand before moving on. The second thing is that even though I give you a list, in some cases you will grasp the pattern faster. So instead of continuing to study solutions, just start practicing. And on the other hand, if you see that you land on a question that you have no idea how to solve, study its solution well to see what was the gap between the patterns that you've studied so far and how this question is solved. Moving to week two, two pointers is similar to sliding window in the sense that there are two pointers in both cases, but here you usually have two pointers that would move towards each other until you hit a certain condition. So if you have an array of sorted numbers and you want to find if two numbers sum up to a certain value, you would move one of the pointers depending on the sum of the current value. There are other cases like fast or slow moving pointers and sometimes you would want to sort the array or store values you iterated on, but these are part of the tricks you would learn as you study solutions and practice. Moving on to recursion and backtracking. Knowing how to work with recursion is really important, not for only array problems, but for trees, graphs, and any time when you don't really iterate. And here is something that will make any question that uses recursion that simple. Whether it's a backtracking problem, trees, or anything else, you have a logic that's before the recursive call and it will run as you go deeper into the recursion. You have the recursive call or multiple calls themselves and then you have the logic after the recursive call that will run as you come back up. 
when you draw this down in a dry run, when you study a solution, it will make a lot of sense. This is how I went from always kind of guessing to knowing how to write recursive solutions. Now, what you will see is that backtracking is just a pattern where the logic after the recursive call brings the current state back to where it was before the recursive call. So we can explore the next set of options. These are the questions for this week. Write down the recursion and pay attention to what the logic before and after the recursive calls actually do. Week four is binary search. In binary search, you're using two pointers again, but you use them to keep track of the middle between them and see whether the value in the middle satisfies the condition. Based on the value in the middle, you determine the value of the left or right pointer for the next iteration. So each time you get rid of half of the possibilities, which gives us the logarithmic time complexity. Most binary search questions actually don't differ much from one another, and it all comes down to determining the update of your left or right pointer after each iteration. Next in week five is stacks. A stack is a last in first out data structure. Whatever value goes last comes out first, and it's used a lot to solve some of the questions optimally. So you can iterate through an array and push each item into the stack and then pop them out. Questions using stacks are also quite similar to each other, and when you study the solutions, you will see that it boils down to just deciding when to push an item to the stack and pop an item from the stack. For the last week of arrays, we're gonna have problems that are solved in a greedy way, meaning choosing locally optimal decisions to reach the global maxima. There are some problems where a greedy algorithm won't work, like if you're standing on a hill and you want to find the lowest point. Going downhill is a sensible decision, but it doesn't guarantee that you will actually reach the lowest global point. But for example, if you need to construct the largest number from a set of digits, you each time will need to make the decision that will lead to the largest number from the first choice down to the last. And many questions like this are solved by a greedy algorithm. In the practice questions, you will know that they can be solved in a greedy way, but in general, to be able to identify whether you should use a greedy approach or not, start with trying to come up with an example where making the locally optimal decision won't give the right answer. If you find one such example, you know that a greedy approach would not be correct. Next large topic, binary trees. A binary tree is a special case of a graph where each node has one parent except the root, and anywhere from zero to two children. For all the binary tree questions, it's all about traversing them. And in week seven, we focus on BFS for level order traversal. We push the root in a queue and then process the whole tree level by level. The nodes that first enter the queue are also processed first. Again, the questions for tree BFS are quite similar and once you grasp the overall pattern, you'll just need to make small changes to satisfy the question. And it's mostly going to be how we process the nodes of the tree when we push or pop them from the queue. For weeks eight through 10, we're going to focus on DFS for trees. With DFS, we're not traversing level by level, but we are going down the tree each time. There are three ways to do a DFS traversal for a tree, in order, pre-order, and post-order. In in-order traversal, we process the left child of the node, the node itself, and then its right child. In pre-order traversal, we are processing the node itself first, and then its left child, and then its right child. And in post-order, we are processing first the left child of the node, the right child, and then the node itself. This is exactly where the previous point about recursion comes into play. Whatever you do before traversing the children nodes as you go down the tree is the logic before the recursive calls. And your logic after the recursive calls is what you do as you go up the tree. So if you want to do a pre-order traversal, you want to write your processing logic before the recursive calls. If you do an in-order, then it's in between the calls for the left and right children. And if it's a post-order, the logic is after the calls as we go up the tree. When you study a solution, see how the type of DFS traversal is used to address the question. So then you can easily see what you should use when you practice. The topic for the last two weeks is graphs and matrices. In lead code, graphs are usually represented with nodes just like how a tree is represented, but now instead of left and right children nodes, you will have a list of neighbor nodes. In the first week, we will cover the basics of traversing a graph with BFS and DFS, and it's pretty much the same as with how we did BFS and DFS with trees. When we do BFS, we will use a queue, and when we do DFS, we will recurse on the neighbor nodes. With a matrix, we will do the same thing, but on the adjacent cells of the current cells, we are traversing in the matrix instead of node objects. 
One difference between traversing trees and graphs or matrices is that you will usually have to maintain some data structure that will keep track of the nodes or cells you visited so you don't traverse them again. And the questions list for this week is split based on graphs and matrices. In the last week, we are going to cover shortest path problems in graphs. Now, even though algorithmically this is a more complicated topic, the questions themselves will be relatively easy when you get familiar with the few different patterns and implementations that are used to solve them. One thing to cover is Dijkstra's algorithm, that's mostly all the theory you're gonna need, and will help you solve many shortest path graph problems like network delay time and path with maximum probability. Especially if you're asked on this during an interview, at least from my experience, the question will be virtually the same, just in different wording. So coming up with the implementation will be easier than compared to other topics where you might need to change a few things. And with that said, thank you for watching. Becoming solid with these patterns is really all you need to pass the vast majority of the technical interviews you will ever have. If you want the Notion template with more in-depth tips and links to all the weekly questions, check out the comment below for the 12-week lead code prep guide.